spoke to Kobe, and then that was it. You know, we just vibed. First practice, first couple practices was super competitive because, you know, you get two lions in the same practice, <laughs> it's gonna be good. to the show is Keisha Johnson. All facts, no breaks. Today's guest is 17-year NBA champion and veteran LA Laker, Meta World Peace. So what's up, Meta? How you doing, man? Everything is great, man. Um, it's a great journey. Uh, you know, retired life. Long time no see. I see you on TV, though. Yeah, I, I know I hadn't seen you in a long time. I actually brought my son in with me, Keisha Jr. So he, he's been working with me on the podcast, kind of you know, learning the ropes, doing a good job at, in handling his business. That's great, man. You got to get him in early, man. If you don't do it, who's going to do it? <laughs> that's that's right. the that's the same way I feel. No question about it. So all the way, all the way from uh, Queensboro Housing Projects out in New York City, you you had a, a, a Queen. What did I say? Queensboro, Queens Bridge. Right? Where, <laughs> yeah. where did I quit? He, he got it right. <laughs> you but said Burrow. Yeah, the borough, Queensboro, oh, okay, okay. it's a Queensboro, Queens Bridge. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 let me let me handle this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but where where did I get that from, Meta? Because the it's five boroughs in New York City, Staten Island, Manhattan, Queens, New York, Bronx. And then on the bridge it says Queensboro Bridge. So if you're driving in New York City, yeah, that's what Queens I know. <laughs> that's but what it's I really know. Queens so, bridge. <laughs> yeah, it's Queens Bridge and through the Queens boroughs. I got it. So growing up in these housing housing projects, you know, how did it shape you for your next life in basketball, whether it was at St. John's or in the NBA? That, that, you know, uh, I think what shapes someone is also what hurts communities. You know, so a lot of people say, oh, man, I love how feisty he is, or I love how feisty she is, football, basketball, boxing, whatever. But to get to that story, you had to see a lot. You had to experience a lot. You know, so it's, it's not it's, sometimes you you hear people are just interested in the entertainment part. But what they don't see is the people that's not here, people that's locked away. And then the adults that went through it, they still on this earth, but they never had the opportunities that we have. So essentially, some are just living to die, you know. So, yeah. you know, it's a it, sometimes you got to put it in perspective. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's been a great journey. So in Queensbridge, though, it, no, New York as a whole, or the five boroughs as a whole, is known for hoops, basketball. But yeah. in particular, Queensbridge is not known for hoops. It's known for legendary rap game, right? The rappers, so yeah. to speak, whether, whether it's uh, Nas or, or Marley Maul or Prodigy or MC Shan or Roxanne Shantae, any of them. Do you remember growing up? Obviously, Nas, you, you, you certainly can remember because that's more us. But then when you start talking about Roxanne, Shantae, and all them, do you remember that? Yeah, definitely. Well, I was born in 79, so you got to think about the errors. When I was born, uh, Roxanne, Shantae used to watch me. My mom used to pay her, I think it was like 50 cents or something like that. So <laughs> I was in her arms as a baby. And then um, me and uh, Marv Deep, that's Prodigy, that group, that group, they used to live on the third floors of my cousins. Um, so Killer B and Havoc and... Prodigy and they used to come around and so I knew them like that. And then Nas was on the other side. Nas was on the uh, you know, Nas was on, you know, the, the OG side. <laughs> and, you know, by the time I was 13 or 90, actually in 93, Nas popped off. So the age gap is so much bigger when you're younger, you know. So I probably seen them a couple of times, but it's the the, the the relationships and like the pones, you know, kind of distant cousin from, from uh, CNN. And the list goes on and on and on. It's just like, yeah, it's yeah. on and on. So clearly, you're not gonna you're not gonna pick a favorite out of all the MCs, though. You just kind of gonna. I, I'm assuming you're gonna stay <laughs> neutral across the board. Now I'm not. I'm not neutral. You know, I think Nas is the best. But my favorite rappers out of Queensbridge are some you know and some you might not know, right? So when you're talking about Queensbridge, because it's very competitive in, in Queensbridge alone. So. In Queensbridge is Nas, um, Carmega. I like uh, Hostile. He passed away. I like um, 
Uh, Prodigy, also Prodigy, not from Queensbridge, but, you know, he's uh, definitely an honorary member. We love him like family. But in Queensbridge, and there's also some really great albums that a lot of people didn't hear from Queensbridge itself. Nas probably got three of them, but then you got a whole stack of others, you know, mm. uh, but Nas is definitely the king. So in, 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 in 06, you made a decision that you was going to dip your toe into the rap game with my world. Did you think, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get in the studios, and I'm going to be the next best rap thing to come out of Queen, Queensbridge? Well, initially, yeah, but well, the problem was, like, so when I was recording, I wasn't doing it like a rapper should, you know, a writer, A&R, producer, engineer. When I was doing it, I was doing it more from an emotional perspective. And then also because I looked up tomorrow deep in nine, so I didn't, I didn't put enough effort to really get myself a shot. Um, you know, to really do what I wanted to do. But 100%, to me, it was a failure, but I'm going to be super honest. 100%, I wanted to be like Mob and Nas. I wanted a platinum album for sure. I ain't going to sit here and act like, you know, <laughs> I ain't want to do it because <laughs> yeah. I thought that it. Yeah, it, right. was, it was always a dream for sure. Well, yeah, the rappers want to be the athletes. Athletes want to be rappers. That's a big thing. So, I mean, that's a big slang. But for me, yeah. I, I can't put myself in the athlete wanting to be rapper. What I can put myself, is I, I seen action, mm -hmm. you know. What I mean, I was, I was in, you know, we seen action, and so I can't really categorize myself as an athlete wanting to be a rapper. <laughs> That's right. a category. So, Meta, your AAU team, you play with Sham God, a uh, guy Sham God. If I said that correctly, you play with with Lamar Odom, Elton Brand. Elton is Elton from New York. Elton, Elton's from Pittsfield. Elton's upstate. Uh, you know. Upstate New York, where it's either really oh, okay. nice or really rough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you play, you play with him, Lamar, and and Eric Barkley. All y'all played AAU together. How yeah. was that? How was that experience? It yeah. was incredible, man. It was incredible. Um, the first time I played against Lamar was in '91. I was 11 years old. He was about six one. I was like six foot. And then the next summer he came back six six, and we all remember that because he just he was tall and still nice. And then I played against Elton for the first time in 93 in five-star basketball camp. And I remember I tell the story all the time. Elton had holes in his, he had such a big hole in his shoe. And I had a big <laughs> hole in my shoe. <laughs> and I was like, yo, let me get you some, because I just played against him. I'm like, man, this dude is nice. So I said, man, let me give him some shoes. And he was a nice guy. You know, Elton's a super nice guy. So I, I went to get him some shoes, but those shoes had holes in it, but it was better than his shoes. <laughs> and then he said, nah, I'm good. And he just played the whole camp. He had three toes coming out of his shoes, man, for the show. <laughs> man, that's crazy. <laughs> now, when you're young like that, it, you know, when you're growing up in these projects, <laughs> my son didn't obviously have to go through that because I paid the way for him. But myself having to figure out how to share shoes, share clothes with family members and whatnot to go play sports, that's a different, it, I don't know what it is, but it just takes yeah. us to a whole nother level. Yeah, you got got to experience that, Junior. <laughs> yeah, did you you played against Kobe in AAU or? I did. Yeah, one time. How it was, was it, that? It was great. Well, at the time, um, I was playing with Aim High, so that was Kenny Smith team. He still got the team to this day. It's called Aim High. So um, Kevin Jackson, a great New York City coach, should have been a pro coach. He was our coach on that team. But like uh, Vincent Smith, Kenny's brother. Uh, a couple other really good guys. So we played against, it was me, Sham God, Shaheem Holloway, and a couple other guys, Raheem Johnson. And then Kobe was, and Rich Hamilton was on the other team also. Yeah, it was, what, it was Rich. Kobe, Vince Carter, Rip Hamilton on their I team, heard, right? I heard Vince was on that team. I can't quite remember, but I remember Kobe because one of our guys kept calling him the next Grand Hill. So they was like, we going up against the next Grand Hill today. And I was a young boy. So I remember I tell Kobe all the time, he had about 30 going into the fourth quarter. Then they put me on him. I think they beat us. Oh, he might have won. I can't remember who won that game. But uh, it was um, definitely a competitive game. Was that like a crazy comparison back then? Like saying you're the next Grant Hill? To be the next like, Grant Hill. Yeah, that was something. Like, yeah, was, Grant Hill oh. was that dude. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah, Grant Hill was nice. You got to think, Keyshawn, he signed. If I can remember, you might remember this, Ron. He signed that Fila deal with Fila tennis shoes. That thing was like. Crazy, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Grand Hill's a deal. Before no, he got it was the Detroit Grand Hill. <laughs> yeah, the Detroit well, Grand Hill. Well, you got drafted 16th overall by the Bulls in the first round of the 1999 draft with Elton Brand, who went number one. 
What was the Bulls atmosphere like in that first era post Jordan? It was incredible. I mean, I was a fan. As a, imagine being drafted to LeBron's team or now like Stephen Curry, you know, and, and you grew up watching. So, but the cool thing about that team was there was like one year off for a championship or two years. So we still rode the championship plane. So the championship plane was crazy because it had, you know, you had your own little suites. Mm -hmm. You had a bar. <laughs> That's hard. A little soul plane. A or soul years, you said what? Is it like a little soul plane? It was, oh, 100% it was soul plan, 100%. <laughs> the crazy <laughs> thing is I, I don't even remember you. I don't, and for some reason, I don't remember y'all playing for the Bulls. Now, maybe it's because I done been hit upside my head too many times. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just one of No, because I only, re, I mean, I remember Elton, obviously, Clippers and Sixers. The Bulls, I don't know. I just, maybe when MJ left, I just stopped watching the Bulls. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't there when him and Pip wasn't there. Elton got a record, the, the most ever consecutive field goals made in United Center. Elton Brand, 14 straight field goals against, against Utah. Carl Malone, the game was incredible. And it was all jumpers. I was like, Elton is nice. <laughs> no, the same, the same dude with the whole same dude with the holy shoes, huh? The same guy, man. It was incredible. Man, 14 straight field goals. He beat MJ record. Which is so what the, so so matter what the hell were you doing working at uh Circus City your rookie year? Yeah, what oh, is going on there? <laughs> yeah, like what? <laughs> you just wanted to get a job or something? Yeah, man, I was trying to like stay out of trouble, man. Cause like so when I first got drafted, oh, if, if practice was over Friday, call it noon, I'm driving to New York back to Queensbridge for like call it 72 hours. Not even that, not 72 hours, like 36 hours. <laughs> so I was always like on the move and I just needed something to fill my time. And I was, and I actually, I was majoring in architecture coming out of high school. So at the same time, now that I think about it, you know, my mind always moving. I'm always thinking about some academic, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I needed to work, you know, even though I was playing, I was working hard. I'd be there two hours after working with, um, working with Pete Myers, you know, on my game after practice. And then you got another, you know, 10 hours before you're going to go to sleep. So I was like, I, I couldn't really figure out what to do. So I said, you know what? I'm going to give me a job at Circuit City. <laughs> and yeah. just start working. Were you ever so, recognized there? Like, did that, anyone ever notice you once? And they're like, yo, is Ron Artest helping me? A rookie, yeah. I was a rookie, kind of rookie fame, 16th pick rookie. Not not quite like MJ, right? But people would be like, man, <laughs> Ron Artest helped me with my... <laughs> yeah, no, I, that's what I'd be like. I need a, a selfie. So you... No. <laughs> So you worked in, in Chicago and in New York. Which which Circuit City? I worked in one. Uh, I worked Highland Park, Circuit City. In oh, Chicago. okay. So in Chicago. Yeah. yeah. And then and then in 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 two thousand two, you was moved in a seventeen trade from Chicago where I, to Indy, where I know Ron Artest. Obviously, I know you from St. John's in New York because I was playing for the Jets back then, and we used to run in each other all the time. But yeah. as a player, I remember Indy. Now all of a sudden. You with Reggie Miller, Hall of Famer, and you with Jermaine O'Neal. What was that experience like moving with a, a seven-player deal, Keyshawn? They had to give up seven players to grab Artes. It, it was weird. When they, when they gave up some of the players, I was like, man, I, I knew I was working on my game, and I knew like what people didn't see was I was locking a lot of people up rookie year, right? So I think that's what Donnie saw. But the offense, you couldn't really see it. And I was like, wow, but I knew I was effective. And when I got on that team, I, we, was, we wasn't even in the playoffs at that time. I got in the starting lineup. I, I contributed to the team. Reggie was happy. Jermaine was happy. And we went to the playoffs. You know, we had to win five in a row, but we went to the playoffs at the you know, end of the season and almost beat the Nets. They went to the championship. So I was mm -hmm. like, man, I'm starting to make an impact. You know, um, but playing with Reggie was incredible. He got in there three hours early before games. First one, first one there. Yeah. Every, every game. So could this 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 year's Indiana Pacer team could they compete with y'all team of 04? Oh uh, man, I'm a little I gotta be a little political about that. <laughs> but, no, um, no, you don't. Nah, it's all facts, yes no breaks, no. man. Come on, it's yeah, all you facts. ain't gotta be political because no you breaks. you they going we gonna slide you on Halliburton and then everybody else we can figure it out. <laughs> hey, that that team was a that team was one of the you know one of the great teams. I, I can't see a lot of teams in the NBA beating that team. I know one would argue, but, you know, when you got me and Stat on the wings and Jermaine at the at, at the bottom and Tinsley, Reggie Miller, we all could shoot and everybody playing defense. <laughs> There's not one person on that squad not playing defense and everybody could score. So 
that that would be really difficult. And you got me at 260 on the perimeter. That's you're not even dealing with that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna put that. you on Halliburton. No, I'm gonna put you out there with Halliburton and let you just because that's really, I mean, for them, Siakam is there, but Halliburton really is the guy. I'm gonna, I gotta have my best defender on their best guy that that could guard five different positions. You can guard five four spots if you needed to. At that at that time, I could guard one through five, one hundred percent. I I've yeah. guarded Iverson. You know, I've guarded Sha Shaq like once, maybe for like two quarters or maybe one time for a game. But Shaq is one of those guys that's just too big. <laughs> yeah, he just too big for everybody. So, you know, it's almost twenty. Who do you years. think your hardest person to guard was? Uh, I, I say right, Rip, Rip Hamilton. Obviously, Kobe and those guys, but Rip Hamilton always stand out because Rip is making you run. So with Rip, he gonna test how tough you are. You know, inside, <laughs> you gotta chase him, and you are gonna be exhausted. And that was that was one of my toughest covers for sure. Yeah, I'm running the I'm running the rip all the time. So Meta, it's it's almost 20 years to the day of the whole Malice in the Palace situation that took place. And I'm sure you <laughs> you talked about this a thousand and one times. Yeah. You know, five million dollars in fines for people. More. What what did you what did you or more. more? More, yeah, or more. What did you learn from this situation and when did you realize uh oh this is getting ready to turn into something more than what it is i learned there's a lot of lessons from that you know from that event one you know if somebody hits you first you can't react <laughs> that was the yeah. biggest lesson. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see Mella, i yeah i get it but i've always been one and i say this all the time don't put your fucking hands on me and we good you can cuss me you can dog cuss me. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. Don't physically approach me, and we good. You know, we can good. Don't throw no objects at me, and 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 I get it. But go ahead, man. But that was yeah. That that was the biggest lesson from that. Like you know, you can't. Somebody can hit you, right? You know, whatever ethnicity in, in this situation it was a white uh, attacker out of the stands against a black victim on the scorers table in my cage. <laughs> you know, in my atmosphere, and then somebody came into our atmosphere, and that's that's legal. You can do that. Um, the other thing I learned was um, we were thugs. <laughs> you know, just you know. So, and it's amazing how they worked that out because when you look at the situations of urban community, they are set it up for failure. Not everybody, but it's set up to fail. But then they call you a thug. <laughs> When you grow up in that environment, and then they and then they poke the bear. You a thug. You a thug. Yeah, because our parents are in prison. It's things happening in the neighborhood. We're growing up around this. Obviously, we got traits. You know, <laughs> it ain't like we grew up with salad and a fork, and we have those traits, right? So I learned that. And then the other thing I learned was it's definitely not worth your career. It was a at that point in time, if you kind of did a, some type of forecasting where my career would have gone, even that next year in the, even without the suspension, that's another all-star, guaranteed. I should have started the year in the all-star game before that. We was the best team in the league, but you know, Vince took the spot. But at that season, I was locking up those small forwards. So that next season was gonna be another defensive player of the year. It was gonna be, a, it was gonna be some more accolades to tack on. But then, you know, when you get traded, you know, it's not your team anymore. You gotta, confide then you get your rhythm but it's not the same as if it was your team right yeah. so i feel like you know that i learned i would tell anybody you know it's not worth your legacy i'm still I, luckily i still do some things i got defense player of the year award you know um some people would say i'm not a hall of famer but some people players a lot of players say i am you know which yeah. is the most important you know what i mean yeah. so it was a lot of lessons to be learned and then now me and the guy who threw the bear that, that's my guy we were friends he's from detroit so now the, that's you know, crazy. <laughs> yeah, so that's my dude. Like, you know, because I always tell people, since when do people get involved in a man and a man's problem? One man hit another man and then another man addressed it. Now I got all these beta, these beta males and beta women throwing an opinion. Like, let this man and this man handle their business. And that's my guy to this day. You know, I'm sort of <laughs> we're friends. He's kind of on a, he a wild card. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> if, if it happened today, what do you think would be the impact? You know, with social media and all that now, what do you think's happening? Because well, it has happened. It, it happened, but you know, you saw the issue with, with Russell Westbrook. It has happened. Yeah. 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 It just had, it hadn't escalated to physicality for the most part. I mean, it's, you know. Yeah. But, but see, I, I don't know, man. I, I just, I grew up like you, Artes. I just grew up in, in on the West Coast of South Central L.A. And yeah. I grew up a certain way. I done been shot twice. All, all of, So my mentality, my you know what I'm saying? My mother was on welfare. We slept in a car as an 11-year-old kid. I understand drugs. I understand all that. So my mentality is I get the league and I get with the commissioner and I get certain things. But my whole mentality is don't put your fucking hands on me. Just don't. <laughs> Touch me. Don't do that. You can cuss me. You can yeah. call me all sorts of things. Don't touch me, though, because I ain't in your space like that. Yeah, so we're I not understand. In your space. Yeah, I, I get it. I understand it the way it looks, but you shouldn't be crucified in your career. You shouldn't, and it's just my opinion, you shouldn't have been crucified and made to look crazy and all that sort of shit. No, you shouldn't have, because if they don't understand your mentality, and where you come from and how you was raised and what you seen growing up, then in the way in the world, you, you understand what I'm saying? They should be labeling you that way, but that society in which we lived in and grew up in, we see things different than the most people. I don't care if it's two black men, two white men, a white yeah. man, a black man. You gotta know who this individual is before you start labeling them something and trying to hurt them to the detriment of who they are in their careers. It just I'll never funny. meet somebody that side with that. And it's and it's interesting because even like some of the our colleagues, whether it was coaches or players, you know, publicly calling me a thug, you know, and it's like we're 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 so far from that now. Yeah, we we under, we understand what that means, but and then you'll see some of them going through the same things that we've gone through, you know, yeah. and and they never really address like you know what was that thug statement about? Can you explain that to me? I'm an architect major, like. You know, I was amazing. You know, I mean, what, what you talking about? <laughs> what you, you know, I went back to school for coding when I retired, and and law, and series seven. What 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 are you, what are you talking about? What are you talking yeah. about? So, yeah, you know, it's it just you know, um, some and, and this is where I like to inspire people. Just because you grow up a certain way, it doesn't mean you cannot become a scholar. You know, don't yes. let people say, "Oh, you're this and you're that. You're a dump jock now." Don't get distracted. You can become a scholar. You can you can become an academic and still be you. Yeah, no question about it. So you move on from that situation. You go to the Kings, the Rockets, but you land here in L.A. with me, and you with Kobe and the Lakers, and all of a sudden you one of the main glue pieces to us winning championships. What was that like being able to play with Kobe and then just find yourself in purple and gold in, on an organization much different than the organizations that were your previous stops? Yeah, it was incredible. You know, when they called, I was at the SLS hotel. I remember I got the call and I, I tell the story a lot. When I, I was in Houston the year before, so I was I was averaging about 25 against the Lakers in the playoffs. So I was I was actually tw 28, 29. So I was in my prime playing pretty well. Um, now entering into my contract year. So I, initially I was trying to go back to Indiana. I was actually trying to go to New York. And but that didn't work out. Then I was trying to go to Indiana. When that didn't work out, I was trying to go to Detroit. Because I was like, okay, if I can't go to Indiana, which I really wanted to, I think going to Detroit would be dope. And I knew I know a lot of people in the city wanted it, but you know, certain people in the organization didn't really want it. So then uh, I'm like just chilling, waiting. I didn't really want to play anywhere else because I was I'm super competitive. I didn't want to play with any other stars. So I was thinking about going to Greece. Um, I was told I called Angola, called Greece, just to have a different experience in basketball. And then I get a call at 1201 from the Lakers. My agent was like, hey, the Lakers want you. I said, I remember, I said, for effing what? Because we just, they just beat us. You know, so I'm like, I'm not, you know, why, why do I want to talk to the Lakers? And he was like, nah, they want, they want you on their team. And I was like, damn, really? So I met Dr. Bust the next morning, spoke to Kobe, and then that was it. You know, we just vibed. First practice, first couple practices was super competitive because, you know, you get two lions in the same practice, <laughs> it's going to be good. You know, and then after that, we just clicked. 
one thing I'll always remember is one game that I went to. It was um, against the Thunder and then you guys. And I just remember, I don't know if it was an accident or purpose, but you elbowed Russell Westbrook. And I've always wanted to ask, like, what happened there? Like, was it an accident or was it? Because I just, that's one thing that I remember so much. It was actually like, James Harden. It wasn't Russell. But I'm sorry. Yeah, James Harden. Actually, so I was, that game, I was actually, I was playing really well. And then Coach Brown, Mike Brown, came up to me and said he want more energy. But I, I, I thought like what he didn't realize was the energies, the flames already lit. I'm from the, I'm from the bottom, so that flame don't, it never goes off. Right. So he was like, Meta, I need you to, I need you to uh, more energy. And I'm like, oh boy. So I went up, so I was playing pretty well. I had about 16 in the first half. Actually, I love watching those clips. You got you got to watch the. I was killing them in the first half. <laughs> he was going I got crazy. A nice yeah. Dunk. Yeah, I, I was dunking on a few of them. And then I got a nice dunk. It wasn't like over the rim, but for me, it was big. I got super excited. And then they pushed me in the back. And that's why I didn't get a lot. I didn't get in trouble too much because um they pushed me in the back. And then I was like, get up off me. And it happened to be, um I didn't mean to hit him in the back of the head. Yeah. It was, it was, it was unfortunate. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah, that was, was that was crazy. crazy. So, Meta, you, you watch a lot of basketball now and you see what's going on with Draymond Green out here every now and then. What type of advice? Because you was an enforcer in your day, and he's one of the last, I guess, of the, the, the modern era, so to speak, enforcers yes. left in the NBA. What, what type of advice would you give him to kind of stay, as, as I would tell Draymond, stay your ass out of trouble? <laughs> well, you know, Draymond's a winner, man, first and foremost. I think towards the end of his career, I think what happened was he, he's not able to do what he used to. You know, you're getting older, so I think he just got to get comfortable with you're not going to be able to dominate no matter what you do. The young players are here, and I think he was uncomfortable with that. But I think once he gets comfortable, like, yeah, you're on your way out, you know, I think he'll be straight. So he just got to, you know, let Father Time take his course, you know, ride. I mean, he, he's already doing TV and all this stuff. He might as well ride that out. There's no need for him. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no need for him to try to be something he was, you know, 10 years ago. When that's in your mindset, then you if a player cross you over and they dunk on you and they and they do this or whatever, you're gonna be upset, right? So <laughs> he got to expect to get his ass bust <laughs> and just, you know, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, that, that, you know what's so crazy? You say that right about Draymond. And I said that this morning about LeBron because when we start talking about JJ Reddick taking the job, one of the things I said is I said, look. J.J. Redick is taking a job, and LeBron James, everybody know LeBron has something to do with him being hired, whether LeBron wants to admit it or not. That's fine. That's cool. Yeah. But at the same time, you got some of these young dudes that's coming into the league, and yeah, he's still King James, but to these young dudes, they looking at him, they're like, man, they not listening, they not feeling that. And now right. when you got a, a young head coach like a J.J. Redick taking over with no, no type of coaching experience, you've been around Phil Jackson, one of the great ones, do you think here in LA, a coach with no coaching experience at all could get it done? Well, I think he's gonna have the support. You know what I mean? When you look at, you know, Coach K and you look at, you know, Palenka and you look at LeBron and you look at, they like the coach, so he'll have support. You know, it's no, it's no different than running running a, a company or running a firm. Just hire the right CEO, hire the right CFO. You know what I mean? Stay out the way. So I think he'll probably even learn a little bit more coming in because he's going to have to lean on more experience. And that's a blessing because you're in the head coach's seat. And then once you get it and you understand it, now you're really taking off. You know what I mean? So, um, but it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely a great opportunity. I was putting my name in the hat for a bunch of head coaching jobs. Um, I've been coaching nine years, actually, in, in Cal State LA. Went to the tournament. Oh, is that right? Yeah, they, you know, they, 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 they tried to, you know, not, they tried not to put my name in the hat. You know, I, I see the media and they already got, I know they already got their names because I actually have on paper experience coaching and going to the tournament on paper. And uh, I seen people know it, but then I saw a lot of people just like just stray away from that because he coming. <laughs> oh, so you over there, you over there with my man, Daryl Gross. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. D Gross, D Gross, D Gross. Uh, he was our yeah. athletic, uh, athletic director at USC. Yeah. Yeah, man. We went to the tournament for the first time two years in a row. First time in the history of the school. Next year, we gonna you know we gonna do more. <laughs> wow! You know, I didn't yeah. know. Now, now I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna I'm gonna slide to the games. I didn't yeah, even slide realize to the that. game. Slide to the game. Oh, don't, sure. don't let them silence your boy. They trying to keep me on the. No, low I got you. Don't even worry about it. I, I got you. 
Yeah, no, with you, you know, when you talk about Gross coaching, is my dude too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my guy. When you talk about coaching, it's all about like, you know, um, and then JJ's gonna have my support also because I'm a Laker yeah. guy. So, but when you talk about coaching, you know, it's about putting people in place. You're coaching emotions. You know, you're running. You're almost running. You, you are running a business essentially. You know, um, but you know, sometimes they act like, oh yeah, this person is not capable of running a business. We got to get somebody in here, you know, but, you know, that lingo is different from us, but we can still, we can still get it going. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We can still for get sure. it going. So I'm coming for the show. So uh, you guys are both one hit, one week wonders on Dancing with the Stars. Uh, you want to talk your about- ass up. You ain't, I'm the only <laughs> professional dancer in the damn family. So, so you want to talk about that? Yo, I was, yeah, man, I was, well, I was missing practice. I was going 30, 30 minutes a day. <laughs> See, that's, you know, that's, that's opposite going, of yeah. my dad. He was going hard, and he still couldn't get it done. No, yeah, but it I was, wasn't I couldn't get it done. I was cold dancing. The problem is I wasn't a, I'm not a social media clown, so I wasn't, like, tweeting and doing all that sort of stuff. And so then at the time, the format really lend itself to having a whole bunch of followers on social media. And yeah, I, wasn't yeah, do, yeah. I just wasn't doing it. So nobody was voting for me. But as far as dancing, come on, man, please. <laughs> my my uh I, I had a pen that got caught on a turn in Peter's dress. So the pen got caught and on the turn, we're like, oh no, this cannot be happening right now. <laughs> so we're talking to each other as we're trying to get this pen unhooked. So we like moving, moving, we get it unhooked. It was a disaster. <laughs> yeah, nobody it was fun it. though. I it had fun. fun. I, it was fun. It was a it was a good deal. Yeah, yeah. So in 20 in, in 2010, Meta, you win the championship with the Lakers. And, and famously, you thank your therapist for getting you through everything and winning that championship. Did people really make a big deal of that, though? Did they try to create something out of that? They tried, but, you know, people, they're they not from where we're from. You know, so what I'm saying, because, you know, um, therapy is expensive. You're talking $100 now, $150 an hour, right? And yeah, if you Sometimes don't got, more than that. Sometimes more than that. If you don't got health insurance... How, how are you going to pay for that? So now you got all these people that are struggling mentally and trying to get through it themselves. So when you go on national TV and you and you put it out there, it makes people feel comfortable. Man, Metal World Peace, that strong defender just thanked his psychologist? What? Yeah. You know what I mean? Gonna... And that's the messaging that people don't get because they don't live in those in the scenarios in which others do. Yeah, I was going to say, you made a fan of my mom when you did that. I remember she was just like, oh, he thanked his therapist. Like that <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's the one thing I definitely remember when you guys won. Yeah, so been, in the sports, man, so many athletes is going through football, boxing, you know, basketball, whatever. Like, we athletes go through so much. So that also is giving athletes the encouragement. Like, it's cool to let people know that, yo, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not myself today. I'm struggling. So many athletes in the, in the locker room that we see – but people don't understand what they're going through. They only see them on television. So for me, it was like trying to bring a little bit of light to that. You know, a meta more on a, on, a, on a serious side though, with this conversation continue. So the mental health issues has always been around, right? They just, they, they uh, characterize it as something different. And, yep. and now you see where professional athletes, like you mentioned, NBA players, uh, NFL players, whatever it may be. You got guys in the NBA like Andrew Drummond, Drummond and Giannis and DeMar DeRozan and Kevin Love all talking about it. And so many people, you know, have been trying to figure out how to get these conversations going and get them going in the right way. Is it such that people are afraid to step out because they, they feel like there's a certain stigma approach to getting help? I mean that 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 that's the way I look at it. you getting help. You're not crazy. You're not. You're just getting help in into to help you advance to another level in life. Yeah, advance to another level. That, it's true. You you the first couple of sessions might be going through some things. You know, you know, digging up wounds, whatever the case may be. But you know, what people find out is when you get through that last couple of sessions, and if you keep going after that on your own time, like you said, you just going to another level. You just you just up on your game. You got more clarity for your business, more clarity for your family. You know, I look at where I'm at now to where I was when I was playing. You know, everything's way more clear now. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between when I first met you at Ron Ortiz, <laughs> hanging out with me, running around in New York City to <laughs> Meta World Peace? 
what's what's the difference in those two people i yeah. would say yeah definitely the, the, era, the eras in time right it's like two separate kind of uh time frames so i think meta is the calm that you know our tests always needed right mm -hmm. being focused being centered you know just, just being comfortable being content and being present you know not worrying about what's happening in the past or the future just being present and letting the days flow you know, uh, you don't have to rush the day. You don't have to rush till tomorrow. You don't have to rush an outcome, right? If you don't get the outcome you want, then you just have no emotional control. And I think that's the difference between, the, you know, the, the stages I'm at in life. I'm, I'm not suppressing who I was because I really, you know, I'm grateful for even being born and being here. But I think that focus is a little bit different. Mm. What kind of music do you listen to? You ever listen to Ron Artest by 42 Doug? <laughs> oh man, so many <laughs> Ray got one too. A bunch of people got run on test song. Yeah, Every yeah, time that, somebody that come out with a song, one. I didn't hear the one by 42 Doug, but I'm listening yeah, to listen to Sade it. though. Okay, no, Wait, I like what? Sade. It's a song, it's a song called what? It's called Ron Artest. It's Babyface Ray 42 Doug. It's it's oh movie. yeah. <laughs> now now you you done lost me with the 42 <laughs> Doug. You know that Keyshawn. You know I don't know who people are, boy. <laughs> I was thinking he would know the song, but no. I know the song. I know the song. Okay, okay, the song. That. Yeah, like Ron Artest. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Shout out to Babyface Ray. Yeah, Babyface Ray. So I, know, how much I heard the song. I had my. I, I was just working one day, you know, and I heard the song. Got my glasses on, like you know, and then I'm like, yeah, I, I'm ready to bop. <laughs> but yeah, no. At the, at, the start of the, at the start of it, it your interviews and he's like, oh, he passed me Kobe to pass yeah. me the ball. So, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, do you get do you get any shots up anymore? Do you go out and get any run with everybody, or you just kind of just chill? I mean, I just, I be hiking a lot. Honestly, I don't drink any. I, I drink tequila, but I don't drink alcohol anymore. So I look at that as a workout in itself. You're drinking tequila? <laughs> what you don't drink alcohol? What the hell are you talking about? What you think? What you think is in tequila? Tequila is different. <laughs> tequila. Is no, you different. know what? I got. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna make sure that uh, my producer is sitting to your reps and get the information. I'm gonna send you some of my tequila. Oh yeah, let us do it, man. I mean, yeah, I like yeah. I'm, in, I'm involved. I'm involved with this brand called Mejenta. Oh, let's so, get it, Mejenta. Yeah, it's it's it's, <laughs> it's additive free. It ain't no chemicals in it. That's it's what just I'm agave, spring water, and yeast. It ain't all them added. No, it ain't. Uh, uh. It ain't that stuff that they floating around out on them shelves. That's what I'm saying, man. Was, you know, tequila. But it is. I, hey, but look, it is it's alcohol. alcohol. It's definitely <laughs> alcohol. You got to think about it. If you had a half, say you had a half a cup, you know, a large cup of vodka and tequila, which one are you gonna be hammered with first? You're tequila. gonna probably be hammered with the you're probably gonna be hammered with the vodka first. Oh, you're gonna hammered be first. Yeah, I wouldn't want to drink that. I'm good yeah, I don't drink, that. I don't drink vodka. All I drink is tequila and, and because it's it's just clean, all that other yeah. stuff I'm I'm good on. I can't drink no sure else. I could do it, I could do gin with a cigar, like every couple couple every you know, couple you times. Know, yeah. You know what? I, I can't drink gin and that's because of how I, it's so weird man growing up everybody smelled like gin yeah like when i was a kid they just smelled like all the you know all of the, the the hobos the bums whatever you want to call it alcoholics they smell like gin and it just <laughs> now they was drinking that seagram's bumpy yeah, bottle yeah. gin i just nah and i, I can't uh -uh, i can't touch it Gives no, you, you're laughing, gives you PTSD, huh? so <laughs> Yeah, for sure. PTSD. I can't mess with it. It's just like weed, which is which is legalized in most states. But yeah. because growing up, I watched the smell and what it did. It's just like now, now I'm like, I get it. I understand it. It's legalized. And God, people do whatever they want to do. But me, I just can't. I'm like, no, nah, it just it's something yeah, about yeah. it that turns me completely away. Yeah, I can see that. You know, because I grew up when you, you know, like we grew up, like we grew up in in projects and in stuff. It's like I'm really not trying to go down that avenue. I'm good, even yeah, though yeah, it ain't yeah. gonna take, even though ain't nothing gonna happen to you. It's just like I watched it, so I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm good. Yeah, I'm not Man. interested in nothing else. I ain't interested in nothing. I ain't interested in being around anything else but weed and alcohol. Yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> I understand it. So, man, thank hey, Ron. Or, <laughs> Ron Meta, I don't even know which way. Somebody asked me, they said, How you gonna address him? I said, Well, shit, I guess I call him Meta. I don't yeah. Meta, uh, Ron, Ron Meta. No, yeah, man, we're not, all, 
<laughs> in all honesty, though, man, I, I appreciate you, both me and my son. I speak for him. We appreciate you for joining the show, man. Tell the family I said what's up. Tell the kids I said what's up. And we'd love to have you back at any time you're available. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. I'm going to be on the show. All Thank right. You. Peace. Peace. All right. That's a wrap for today's show. Thanks to Meta World Peace for joining the show. And don't forget to subscribe to the All Facts Pod wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube.